You've probably heard of consultants who work with city governments, but have you heard of nonprofit organizations that help design policies for local governments? We'll talk about one such organization on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. Hi, I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. Many people might agree that given all of the problems our cities face, they need all of the assistance that they can get. Well, did you know that there is a national nonprofit called FUSE that partners with local governments to come up with solutions that address local issues? According to the organization, it has placed in the past seven years more than 140 fellows in over 80 local government agencies throughout the U.S. On this show, I'll talk with Jerry Chang, a FUSE fellow who has been working with the city of East Palo Alto. He will tell us more about the FUSE program, how he became involved, and the type of projects that he has been working on for the city. Well, thank you so much, Jerry, for being here. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you, Henrietta. Thank you for having me. Yes. How long have you been with the FUSE program? I've been with the FUSE program since the end of September uh, 2019, so um, just under a year. And when did you start with the city of East Palo Alto? Uh, October 1st. Ah, yeah. one month after being in the program. Um, uh, less than that. Uh, about two weeks after being selected and one week after um, well, actually, immediately after uh, a week-long training. Just a week-long training? Yeah, yeah. The, the training is to help us orient um, and align the values and the experience that we come to FUSE with, um, with the um, values of FUSE, uh, what FUSE brings for city governments, and to just prepare us for what the experience will be like. So let's talk about the FUSE program itself. Uh, say more about it. What exactly is it? So um, the FUSE program uh, put on by FUSE Corps uh, is a one year long uh, professional, um, private sector professional working in city government. Um, generally the cities identify with the help of FUSE uh, certain projects that um, fit the FUSE criteria and FUSE will go on a national recruitment campaign to identify professionals from the U.S. And oftentimes these professionals are coming from halfway across the country. And um, there's a lot of work done in the in beforehand to make sure that there is alignment with skills and values um, and experience. So it seems that the cities register with the FUSE program. Yes. And, and FUSE then finds fellows That's right. to match. Yeah. Cities and FUSE will work to develop a project description. And then FUSE has you know, an army of recruit recruiters, and they scour the country to find so the do right the, candidates. So do the cities have to fall within a certain criteria? Um, it has to be a project that's um, aligned with the FUSE mission and goals. And let's talk about those mission and goals. Absolutely. Um, um, much of what FUSE is doing is to identify some of the largest challenges we have um, in this functioning democracy, um, making sure that we have um, an equity perspective, um, making sure that we're having experienced talent, um, making sure that the work somehow advances and um, uplifts the community voice. Um, they make sure that FUSE fellows can go in and um, network with the community and the community organizations and leaders and really have the opportunity to deliver something of value to the community that maybe the cities have had struggles in the past producing 
um, for whatever challenges that So nothing be. is off the table when it comes to what, city problems? Uh, yeah, I, I would say, you know, there are specific, um, there's specific momentum behind certain problems that might be more attractive than others. Uh, I'm not, you know, in that room making those decisions with views, um, so I don't know the details of that. So it's my understanding, and I guess you've just kind of confirmed it, that the FUSE fellows are professionals in their own right yeah. before they get involved in the program. That's right. So what did you do? Um, before this, I was um, in Hayward Promise neighborhoods working across the Bay. And we were developing a cradle to career um, a support structure in Hayward to serve two um, communities. Uh, two specific neighborhoods and I was their data lead so I developed the data program um, across 10 partners and 30 programs. Yeah, now the Promise yeah. program it's my understanding it's part of what Promise Neighborhoods? Yeah this particular which one. Was, yeah. Which was kind of patterned after the one in Harlem, That's the right. Harlem P Promise yeah. and you had mentioned from cradle to, to career to career yeah. to help what, low-income communities, so children in low-income communities? Yeah, and in particular in Hayward, we made sure we had a two-generation, a multi-generation approach. Um, so much of what allows a child to be successful is the circumstance that they are in. And much of it is the financial stress causes them to be distracted or unable to fulfill their obligations with school and education. So we found that having a two-generational approach where you support the parents' financial well-being really is a big factor in the students being able to be present. How do you support the parents' financial well-being? Well, um, for us, it meant um, you know, workforce development. You ah. needed to make sure that the parents had the availability to be trained to have access to so, outcomes. so Jerry, how did you get involved in in Hayward Promise? Or? It, yes, in Hayward Promise. Um, yeah, that's. Uh, I had been a, a student leader at Cal State East Bay prior to being involved, and Cal State East Bay is the um, backbone agency for Hayward Promise. Um, I was nominated and elected as student body president uh, the year we started the Hayward Promise program, so I was familiar with it. Um, at the time, I was getting a master's degree in statistics, and um, after my time at East Bay, I went to CORO, uh, it was another fellowship program. Yes, yeah, C-O-R-O. Yeah. Yes. And um, after my experience at CORO, I knew there were, there were ways of supporting my community that I wanted to, to bring back. I went to the Coro to actually to, to really learn that Coro education and bring it back to underserved communities. Um, what I learned so, that Coro yes. was doing that already, and I really just needed to be part of that. So, what is that Coro education? Is yes, get yeah. Um, Coro's education. Um, there's a philosophy that the city should be a lab, um, and you go in the first day of Coro. Um, you, you go in and you basically um, establish a relationship with a city. And but not a lab for experimentation. Um, it is a lab for learning. Ah. And for learning through um, building relationships and under developing an understanding of the interconnects of all the community stakeholders that really need to be present for a functioning democracy to work. So the FUSE program is a one-year program, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And you're paid either by the organization that you were with or through the FUSE fellowship program uh, yes. with a stipend. Yes. So are you paid through FUSE? Um, yeah, my understanding is FUSE as a nonprofit, they accept donations and support from um, cities, from private funders, um, and from that I am paid uh, as a contractor. 90000 a year? Um, I'm not sure what the, the compensation is year after year, but I, I mean... 12 months a year, uh -huh. 8 hours a day, 40 hours per week? 
Uh, depending on the requirements of the project, yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, I would imagine some FUSE fellows work more than that. Oh, yes. How many in your class, your FUSE class? Um, I don't know the exact number. I want to say somewhere between 30 and 40. In each class, and you're assigned, that's not necessarily to 30 or 40 different cities. Many cities have um, more FUSE fellows. Um, so certain cities that have been with the FUSE program longer may have up to, you know, in the 10 or in the teens. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact numbers are. Uh, East Palo Alto has two. Um, I think this is the first year East Palo Alto has had FUSE fellows. The very first year. Mm -hmm. yeah. FUSE is still a fairly young program. Um, Do cities have to be on the waiting list? I, I don't know, actually. Um, you know, when I asked Fuse at my mid-year retreat, I said, hey, you know, I, I have a connection with Hayward. They're a city that um, has a lot of wonderful things going on, and, you know, Fuse fellows seem to be able to come in and, and help, you know, accelerate that process. So I asked them, hey, would, would, would Hayward be something that, you know, and they said, yeah. I mean, if you know people from Hayward, connect them with me, too. So I think, hey, I think Fuse is pretty open to making positive change in this world. And they're looking for opportunities to find where they can do that. How did you get, did you select East Palo Alto or were you assigned to East Palo Alto? I was, I was choosing between three programs. I'm gonna be perfectly honest. Um, the, there was one program that was aligned with what I was currently doing. And it was uh, closer to home. So I thought that was a simple one. There was another program that Fuse thought I would be good for. And then, and then there was another program that I thought, wow, like, that would be amazing. Um, it's what I would want to do. It's in the area where I would want to be. But man, it's going to be more disruptive to my life. And like, I, I don't know if, if Fuse agrees that I would be a fit for that. So um, you know, I talked to Fuse, and we worked it out, and uh, they they asked me to apply and just let me let them know which ones I was interested in. And by then, I think my heart was pretty dead set on East Palo Alto. Why? Is that the program that would be disruptive to your life? <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to say disruptive, because when I, when I met more Fuse Fellows, I found out how ridiculous that thought was. There are Fuse Fellows who literally moved halfway across the country oh. with one week's notice with families. Right, and houses. I, I don't have any of that. You know, I'm, I'm renting, I'm in the East Bay. You know, my, my disruption to my life was that I have an hour commute every day. Right. That, that Round trip? Each way. Each way. Each way. Yeah. That can be disruptive, especially given the traffic. Yeah. And Bay Area, you know, we, yes. we all know. And I, I found out that uh, there's a lot of local traffic issues. Ah. You know, I was prepared for the bridge. Yes. I was prepared for the 880. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. But even just getting around town, right? Going from Tate Street to, to City Hall and on University. Uh, sometimes Depending that's, on when you're going, that's right? That's right, yeah. And if you're going in between when Tate is closed and before City Council, you know, is, is starting, I mean, you might take that whole time just getting there. So what was there, what program was it that would have been amazing mm -hmm. that attracted you? Uh, the one I just want, the one I wanted, or, I mean, I fell in love with the East Palo Alto program when okay. I, when I saw that it was on the list after I was talking to Fuse. So that was the, the one. But the original one that got me thinking about Fuse was working in education um, in Oakland. Yeah, because I was working in education in Hayward. So it was just a, a natural, a natural hop, trend. skip, and a jump. Yes. Right. Um, now, the one in East Palo Alto is different. It is, is different. It? Yeah, yeah, it is different. So my project is to strengthen the civic identity of East Palo Alto through the development of a new city hall. Um, and that includes city hall facilities such as a police station, courtyard, um, maybe community center. Now, what does that involve that you do? 
strengthen the sense of identity. Yeah, that's the that's the more ambiguous part. Yes. Right. So does it leave it up to you in terms of what that means, or are there guidelines? How do you strengthen a sense of identity, and does that assume that the people there do not have a sense of identity? Huh. I haven't thought of it that way, but um, you know, I, I saw it as the lack of hallmark or landmarks, right? There's not something you can point to and say, that's the city, that's the symbol of the city that I belong to, right? I'm thinking the physical building. Um, and cities have that. I think cities it, have that? Yeah. I there is a set, what, what is it usually, a city hall? Mm -hmm. um, so, like, and do I, people identify with their city halls? Yeah, yeah. I mean, those are good questions. So, those are the type of questions that I want to make sure is being asked, and I want to make sure that those questions are asked, not just of uh, me, the person working on the project, but also asked of all the consultants I work with, right? Also asked of the city staff and the teams and the cities that I work with. But I think most importantly is that question should be asked in forums where city, community, and leaders are all together. So who came up with that as a project to strengthen the sense of identity? Yeah, I, yes. I, um, usually the project descriptions are worked on, I believe, with Fuse and the city. Um, so I imagine there's just a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, writing down of an idea and then just kind of building on that. Um, Fuse practices human-centered design. So there's a lot of really engaging stakeholders and allowing iterations upon iterations to improve that design. Well, it occurs to me as we talk that the city lost its downtown, what was then considered its downtown, yeah. and now is in the process of constructing a business district that would be its center. So maybe, I shouldn't say maybe, but it seems that would be a natural part of constructing a, a new city center, huh? Absolutely, yeah. But do you construct that city center first and then strengthen the people's identity to it? You first have it, right? Yeah, yeah. And then there is something for them to latch on to. Right. But this, this way it's abstract. Yeah, yeah. Which makes it a little harder. Yes. Um, I'm operating under the assumption that you want to get there with everybody, right? I, I don't want to be in a paradigm where you have people like designers who think they know everything about what it needs to be designed. So they go and they lock themselves in a room and they go design. And then they say, hey, I have this design now. This should work perfectly well for everybody. You all should come in and use it. And then people look at the design and say, oh, I, I don't know that that has anything to do with me. Right? And then there's actually a, a disconnect. I think with this approach, as we develop the new center um, and engage the community in what that identity is, we're really putting what should happen in the beginning to be in the beginning, which is the conversations of all the stakeholders who are building the future infrastructure, the buildings, the roads, the, the, the off-ramps, the bike lanes, the parks. You who know? are those people? Now, uh, I can immediately think of city staff. Yeah. They would be involved. Absolutely, yeah. But then the residents. The residents, right. right. Uh, the developers, right. The people moving into the buildings that developers are building. Um, they would be the employees, would uh, they be? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but they haven't come yet. I mean, you have to have the building first, and then right. you hire the positions. Right, right. Um, so there's a lot of conversations that may have to happen in a distributed way, right? And that, that's through, like, um, public relations engagement. Right? Um, if we can if we can make a declaration of what it is that we hope to see and build in the future, much like we have with um, like our general plan and, and vision, you know, 2035. And so building on that work, trying to make things more tangible, right? 
as certain projects get approved, well, now we know that project's going to happen. Okay, so now it's like a jazz band. The next project has to harmonize with what has been approved. Do and, you play music? Um, I learned music in the beginning, but I don't say I play it now. Because I'm thinking a jazz band. <laughs> Mm -hmm. oh, everybody can be off doing his own thing and it kind of comes together. Yeah. So would you say, I mean, if you're going to deal with all of the stakeholders, the mm -hmm. city staff, the developers, the residents, mm -hmm. the future employees perhaps, yeah. how do you get everybody on the same page? And, and where do you start? Yeah. You yeah, what, what starts first? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's always the hardest part, right? Um, in the startup world, there's a saying, the hardest part is getting started. Um, so, As with my show. <laughs> as with your show too, yeah, certainly. I love it. It's, 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 it's common wisdom that we all, we all need to, to Have listen a starting to more point, of. Huh? Yeah. Um, so my first um, act, uh, like when I, when I came on, was to understand what I didn't know. So um, given that you know, there, there's not a lot of time to do what it is we have to do. Um, One year. Yeah. I looked at who, how can I get really dense conversation? How do I find people who have very rich experiences so that my engagements, hopefully with them, provide multifaceted perspectives, right? So. The first thing was, okay, so I need to talk to residents, I need to talk to staff, right? Immediately, those were the two groups. Well, the city of East Palo Alto is a wonderful city. We employ, I, I believe it was something like 25% of our city is, is you know, our city staff lives in the city borders. And many of them live just outside. So that was the first place I started. I started interviewing city staff who also lived in the borders or are active community members. Um, and, you know, I started with three questions. I said, what's going well? What's not going well? And what do you think the future will be? So let's take those questions. Mm -hmm. What's going well? What's not going well? And yeah. what do you think the future will be? What's going well is that there's a lot of diverse opinions. <laughs> uh, I would think. <laughs> yeah. It's going really well. That's really, really well. Um, I heard everything. I heard um, people say certain things are exactly what it is that's going well, and people will say that same thing is what's not going well, right? Like, like the same answer, that same sentence would be on both of those would be answers. So I think the first place to start is just to lay it all out. This is what I hear. This is the diversity of voice and a perspective and opinion, right? And there's a start there. And what about you? Did anybody challenge why you're here doing what it is that you're doing? Absolutely. People are doing their homework here, and I love it. It's, it's, it's what every community should learn to do. Um, I, had, um, I had a little bit of skittishness in the beginning, because I didn't know how I should put myself out there. And I come from the public sector, right? I, I come from the private sector, so you know, a lot of times with the private sector, you could just kind of go and do stuff, and then oh yeah, yeah, and then you kind of don't really have a lot of repercussions, um, or someone would throw money at the problem and it would get solved. I knew in the public sector that wasn't the right approach, right? It, it wasn't. You can't kind of go out. Well, do you know? I have found. I, I mm -hmm. once had an economics professor to say, if you throw enough money after it, you'll solve the problem. But I haven't seen any problem solved with money being <laughs> thrown at them. Yeah, maybe it's like you throw up enough of a curtain and, and, and wind the uh, smoke screen that people don't see the problem anymore. Ah. But um, yeah, I don't think that's what's happening here. I think for me, um, not having like an understanding of or comfort with public sector work, because I'm not in it. Um, I knew I had to get out in the public, um, but I wasn't sure what I was doing would be allowable. So I, I was like, oh, let me take a little risk, right? And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna just hold some meetups. Now, b b before we go further with mm -hmm. the meetups, why did you think what you were doing might not be allowable. What were you doing that would be questioned? Well, I wanted to engage the public. Yes. Right? But I knew like 
I wasn't a city representative. I mean, it was like my first month on the job. I didn't know anything about anything. Um, you know, well, I could do all the research and read all the articles on East Palo Alto, but like that's not I, I, experience. And did somebody say, but what makes you qualified? Oh. As you said, <laughs> you don't know anything about anything. Yeah, Maybe yeah. that's a good, a, a good way to approach things, not yeah. knowing anything about anything, yeah. and you're open to learn, but yeah. what did you tell them? <laughs> or yeah. did somebody ask? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the philosophy of like walking into new experiences with the beginner's mind, right? So admitting that whatever it is that you think you know is just things that you think you know. So. That's why I say I showed up not knowing anything. You know, it's not that I didn't have you know, experience or history or, or, or have done my homework. Um, but I had, uh, in my, in my uh, six years working with the community at Cal State East Bay, I had done a lot of work understanding identity change. And I myself, being kind of recruited into leadership at Cal State East Bay also was going through an identity change. So when I saw the FUSE opportunity, um, kind of at towards the end of uh, the, that six years, I wanted the opportunity to s take what I learned about developing identities in Hayward and my own journey of inviting a new identity in for myself to help add to the, the conversation here, right? I think that's the, the core of what Fuse is hoping to do. In the private sector, sometimes you find more space to have more experiences, and because of that, you gain certain insights about what, what projects might need to get over that hump. And it became clear that when I was working with Fuse on identifying which project I wanted to work on or apply for, it became clear that that was the unique life experience that I had that made me. Oh, the identity? Yeah, the ah. having gone through an identity change, having, having supported people who strengthened their identity, right? So now whether or not all those assumptions early on really played out the way I thought it would, probably, I mean, I never really looked back on that. But that's what brought me to do the work. So I, I am sorry, but that, that leads me to ask sure, yeah. what the identity change was about. The oh, personal yeah, yeah, identity yeah. change, yeah, yeah, very, very and fair and how question. that kind of coincided with the identity search yeah. that you're now involved in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A wonderful question. Um, when I first uh, when I first started like um, like long term employment, uh, it was uh, it was in sales. And, you know, I had done like retail sales uh, growing up. It, it helped uh, put me through college. So going into a B2B sales, you know, business to business, uh, industrial sales, uh, was a shift. But um, I was lucky enough to be nurtured by my, my mentor and boss, and he helped me. Um, and we built a, a quite a successful program in a very short amount of time. And he promoted me to be a sales manager. And as good of a performer I was as a salesperson under his guidance, I was not qualified to lead a sales team. And that's what actually led me to go back to Cal State East Bay to, to advance my education, was seeing that even with the bachelors, even with having built businesses and programs, when I was in charge of a team leading people I, I didn't really qualify. And I realized that that was something I needed to address. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, where I wanted to go in life needed me to have those skills, right? So I went back to Cal State. I, oh, I went to Cal State East Bay. It was the school that didn't add to my commute, and I could start taking classes right away. 
And when I felt ready, I knew I could take, go into a master's program. So I started taking classes there. And um, that started the trans transition. And then implementing what I was learning in my classes forced me to be accountable in that community. And that was how the change started to happen. The change from the private sector to the public sector. Yeah, from someone who was trying to build a successful career for himself to someone who's trying to make a difference in the world. So what it's, ah, that's it. I was going to say the values change. Yeah. And, and because I just heard make a difference in the world. Yeah. And maybe working in the private sector did not give you that feeling that what you were doing was making a difference in the world. Why is it yeah. important to, to, to make a difference in the world? A lot of people just say they want to make the money. <laughs> I, I, I certainly did. I, I certainly did, yeah. Um, and I've always wanted to be a teacher when I was young. And I always wanted to retire to be a teacher. And that wasn't because I wanted to retire to be a teacher. That was because I knew you couldn't make enough money to really like, raise the kind of family I wanted to raise being a teacher. Now, I know that's not true. Teachers are, are, are really uh, um, amazing and, and, and doing amazing things with, with what they got. And, but we need to pay them more. Yes, I <sighs> was going to say, yes. But um, uh, oh, going back, so you know, at somewhere in that you know, there's a saying I, heard, I remember hearing. They said, like, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're not a communist at 18, uh, uh, check your heart. Ah. And if you're, if you're a communist <laughs> at 35, check your brain. I don't know. I'm not saying yes. I agree with any of that. It's just yes. that something I heard, yes. right? And, and, you know, it was something that's It's like people being, I guess, uh, very radical when they're younger and more conservative as they grow older. That's true, yeah. You don't, it, 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 it's odd sometimes to find it the other way around. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think the, 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 the desire to just give and give and just be with the world. I mean, at 18, when I was starting my life, that was really present. But, you know, going through college, uh, getting jobs, and it really became something that you kind of really, oh, no, 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 I can't make a difference until I become wealthy. Oh, I need to be a philanthropist. Oh, I need to be a donor. Oh, and then, like, it just was like I'm always waiting to do something that ah, I actually wanted to do. Yes. And I filled my life with, like, trying to make money for other people, right? Until you made enough money to make a difference in the world. Yeah, and that just never happened. <laughs> so do you feel now that you're making a difference in the world? So now I think, yeah, having given up on like trying to really make that kind of money that like I've been telling myself I need to make, I found that what I was trying to fill with money doesn't need to be filled anymore. In, in, does, does that kind of resonate? It, I don't know. So. Uh, but that emptiness, that sense of need, or what you were trying to fill with money that, that, doesn't need to be filled. A sense yeah. of accomplishment? Yeah, there you go. The sense of like, I'm doing ah. something productive, I'm, I'm trying to achieve my goals, I'm like, being yeah, and just working worth for the money while. isn't yeah. good enough. Yeah, that was never. And it was always not knowing what else to look for, right? Because it seemed like money was going to be the thing that solved your problems. But yes, it ended and, up just and so being many people screen. think, just give me the money, and yeah. there's so much I can do with it, and, and still, with the money, you still have problems. Yeah, I mean, that's so right. So that doesn't do it, right? That's right. That's it, absolutely right. It, it does meet certain problems, but... Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Mean, I mean, not having money is a huge problem. Having too much money is also a problem, right? But what is it that gives you a sense of self-worth? Yeah. So now, I think giving a sense of self-worth is being a part of somebody's discovery for a more positive future that they can live into. And do you think people are buying into it? So you had those meetups. Mm -hmm with the community yeah and what what was uh, the purpose of the meetup what came out of the meetups and i think you had three of them yeah. did you have three um, meetups i had three meetup uh 
there's the three types of meetups, but I would hold one meetup multiple times to make sure I'm hitting the right schedule and people's, you know, to align so I can um, get more people in. And, and what was the um, topic of the meetup yeah. and the goal of the meetup? Um, the first set was just meet and greet. Uh, the second set was um, a series of conversations to explore identity. Um, identity for whom? The city? Individuals? Uh, a definition of identity. Both. What would an identity be? Yeah, yeah. So remember, we're not, we're not trying to, I think, define everything in one go. We're starting to have the conversation. We're trying to... Um, be transparent about what the tools we use look like and have the community use those tools for themselves so they can evaluate um, how the tools could be adapted for them. I think that was so far as the intention of all the experiences I've been creating. So I would have to ask what tools? What tools, yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. So um, the tools are the shared experiences that we go through. So at these meetups, at these uh, innovation labs or co-visioning and prototyping labs, um, it's about having shared experiences. So you said when I first showed up, what, what, what did I do to get started? It was accepting the diverse perspectives. And I think the second, the second level of that is then um, understanding um, oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought there. The second level of understanding the diversity of the ideas or after the first meetup, which was oh, yeah, yeah, um, shared experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, oh, the tools, right? I identifying the tools. Um, so when you have a diversity of perspectives, um, the perspectives are usually are from your experiences. So we all have different experiences in life which lead us to have different perspectives. And then as we have our different perspectives, even though we have shared experiences, um, our different perspectives make us have different reactions to shared experiences. But at least it creates a tangible um, reference for people to address and reference, like, refer to. So. Many of these first experiences I'm trying to create with the community is a reference point for people to refer back. Oh, oh, I remember that activity we did with identity. I remember like when we did that activity, these things came up. And then, then they can reference that, right? They can say, this is why when I was looking at these two values, this one came, like, oh, I, I'm sorry, yeah, this one like, well, like, like rose up for me versus an, another one that maybe like, was deprioritized. Um, so there's like a lot of these activities that happen in these meetups and they provide the shared experiences so that people can start exploring their perspectives and finding that even with diverse perspectives, there's still common ground. Many times we share the same values, but our perspectives allow us to express them differently. And I'm thinking sometimes the goals are different, yeah. or how we perceive those goals. Yeah. So where did it leave you? What conclusions could you draw? So far, what I've experienced from the community is that the values are very aligned. And the perspectives of how what we should do might be different. Um, and I think that's exactly where the work so, needs to be now. So when you talk about values, what values are you talking about? What values hmm. are aligned? Um, one of the activities I did in the identity meetups was uh, something called the value card sort. Uh, you start with something like 80 values written on cards. And you have to arrange them and prioritize them. So the first prompt I did was just, which values are important to you? The next was, which values are needed in East Palo Alto? And define a value. Um, something like security, right? The need to feel safe 
and secure in your place. And another value? Um, mm -hmm. Family. Uh, another one was justice. Um, one that came up would be like ecology, um, community, um, helpfulness. Um, I, I ended up uh, collecting uh, community responses when they did the values exercise and created some word maps. And you could see certain ones just, just rose to the top. Yeah. What values got, were the priority? Uh, I'm trying to remember some of them. Um, one that stuck out in my mind a lot was ecology. Really? Yeah. And it was... Um, some might think security and safety. Yeah. And I, I dug into more about why it was ecology. And, you know, everyone defines words different. So these cards, you know, they, they, they write a little bit just to help norm to one definition. And the way they define ecology talked about the harmony we have with our surroundings. And I think a lot of the community residents felt that the security of uh, that we could feel here has a lot to do with how we harmonize with our surroundings and with the people in that space. So that's what I what, what I kind of read from those two. Do you know there is a sense in which it seems abstract? Absolutely, yeah. And then how do you make it concrete? I mean, how do you take those values and then begin to talk about the sense of identity? Yeah. Where are you in the process? Yeah, we're definitely in the process. So um, we do make sure we want to you know, give people a sense of what's happening next. So um, with the values exercise and, and, and that, that set of experiences, there was another activity we did where it was a chance to express your values in tangible format with city infrastructure. Um, we had a large uh, uh, whiteboard about the size of uh, two large long tables. And it was a blank whiteboard and we drew a river in the middle. And the prompt was, in silence, draw your ideal community. And the community members started just drawing things they wanted in an ideal community. And I let them know, like, you don't have to be limited thinking the community is East Palo Alto. It's really just be free, uh, really open-ended. And that was a tangible representation of what it is that they thought an ideal community should have. That, that was an expression of their values. And how will that materialize? Do you take that back to the designers? Or is that something that goes to the city staff and it has to be approved? And then does the city council have to? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, would love to, to, I would love to imagine that you know, um, the work at this stage is ready for that. And it's not. Like, well, we're right now in July. Mm -hmm. And you start it in September, right? Yeah. yeah. So you have two more months to go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Holding me to account. Yeah. Oh. So. Or extend. It, can or it be extend. extended? Can it be extended? Um, it's a. Uh, it's not exactly an extension. Um, you know, there, there is the desire to make sure we're always growing, right? And. The second year of a Fuse Fellowship is called the Fuse uh, Executive Advisor. Ah. So, um, an extension uh, is limiting because you keep the scope. With the executive, with the executive advisor, you get to reimagine what the scope could be. Because I have a year of understanding the community, so hopefully, my understanding can help support. Um, a, a, another year of the project that that's what I would think yeah. that if it's not completed mm -hmm. and you have a second year you don't go off to something else yeah. that you're held accountable that's right to making something happen something right. concrete and something material that's right so where are we in the process <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. or should so, I say we or, is that or, you? Me, yeah, me. Yeah. or the community <laughs> yes. because I, I mean yes. really I'm delivering for the community the um, 
the the title of the project right the, the, is is strengthening civic identity through the development of a new city hall and like I said it was actually city hall buildings um, so so far our conversation is much around the strengthening civic identity but also there's a tangible deliverable to my work with the city outside of this community engagement work um, the community engagement is necessary for me to do the other part of my work with any sense of integrity and that's um, delivering on a facilities master plan and also um, um, setting the city up for tenant improvement of the existing city hall. So uh, those parts of the project I have been working with the engineering team on and we're, mm. yeah, we're at the stage where we're, um, we're understanding the existing conditions and have a good sense of the space and planning needs for our facilities master plan. It seems that we're talking about two things. We're talking about a new city hall, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we're also talking about, you said, improving the current city structure. The city um, structure, the, the identity in the... Are there some plans in terms of the current city hall. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. because Sorry, I, I know the, the yeah. city council's talking about moving the, yeah. so why? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to be talking about a new city building, mm -hmm. why now talk about improving the, the existing, current? Existing, yes, right, yeah, absolutely, yes. absolutely. Um, I, um, the, the project was defined, in, you know, prior to this, so, um, that was part of it. Right, uh, right. So okay. that was, that, that all was designed before. Um, the, the existing city hall space um, has some audiovisual challenges. Yes, it does. That I think really should not wait. Ah, so, okay. So okay. I'm very much aligned with, with the project on that. That, that needs to happen. Uh, unfortunately, there's just, there's always going to be challenges for how to make changes to a building that's not yours, right? So um, we're learning how to do that. Well, I know there were there is talk about how to change how where the city council is currently positioned, right. where the staff is positioned. Is that to improve the acoustics, or is that more, um, what's the purpose of that? Yeah, I mean, there's an element of that. Uh, I think that was just like, when we looked at all the pros and cons, that was one of them. Um, we explored moving the orientation of the, the city council chambers. Um, mostly, from, from my end, it looked like it was a symbolic change. Ah. Because um, then the city council, the, the council dais would be facing out, looking through the window into what would be the community. And which seemed a little strange to me mm -hmm. because while this is the window mm -hmm. and you're talking about having the city council face the window the audience that comes to the city council isn't that way it's over here so mm -hmm. wouldn't you want there to be more of an interaction with the people who attend the council meetings mm -hmm. rather than the people out there through the window oh yeah yeah so it, it'll be um so when we looked at shifting it to the other orientation um we still had the community members in front of the the dais, and then the window would be behind the community. So, oh, yeah, the, so the you would be shifting them back more into the audience, the council, uh, it was, to it's make actually, that space. We we were looking at just or, uh, rotating the orientation 180 degrees. So what we're talking about is strengthening the sense of identity. Yeah. And I would think that everything you would be doing would be strengthening that sense of identity. Does that strengthen the sense of identity? Um, I, I hope so. Um, so. Or is that one of the purposes of so it? So when, when, when I look at it through, if I was a community member that was not engaged, and the only reason I'm there is because I'm using the ATM machine, right? There's usually a line, especially right around 5.30 to 6. If I happen to be there waiting in line and I look up and I look through the windows and I see people sitting there, I see council, I see activity, I might be curious. Uh -huh. 
And then if I look around the window oh. and I see all the, all the agendas, I might look. So you're saying the window is here, the audience would be there, and the city council would be here. Mm -hmm. So you're right there while you're waiting in line at the ATM. You, you, you get a sense of, oh, there's something I might be missing out on that I might be a participant of, hopefully. Well, I'm just thinking uh, they could be waving, trying to get people's attention. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And distracting, too. Sure. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's, that's, if nothing else, I would think it puts people in the mindset of change. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Of, of maybe getting out of a certain routine. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and maybe that in itself makes people a little more open. Yeah. We'll see. I hope so. So this is July, Jerry. Uh -huh. <laughs> you have until September, mm -hmm. at least for this, this part of the fellowship. That's right. And where is that sense of identity? Where is it with you in terms of the original goal? Do mm -hmm. you think you have, you are achieving what you might have anticipated? Yeah, yeah, let me think about that. Um, yeah, I'm not even sure what I anticipated. Well, I know you came to it with an open mind. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But were there any expectations at all? Or talking about visualization, mm -hmm. did you have any ideas about where you would be in July and how far you would come by the time September rolled around? Yeah. You know, in, in human-centered design, there's a, there's a graphic. That it's, it looks like two hills. And it, des it, it describes the design process of what it looks like. Um, at the fuse orientation, they gave us a graph that looked very similar, but it had more ups and downs. Ah, oh, and it was kind oh. of describing what it looks like when you're thrown into an unknown situation um, for a year. And um, you know, so far, I'm, I'm looking at that chart and did it follow kind of my experience? And yeah, somewhat. Well, I would think you know there are certain goals. Mm -hmm. There is a program, you started out in September, this is the project. And so, if we're talking about something that's achievable, if we're talking about something that's concrete, mm -hmm. then there's something that would be expected. Absolutely. At the end of that year. Mm -hmm. So the year is approaching. Where are we? Yeah, we're looking at uh, delivering on the master facilities plan in by the end of uh, September and the that's the new city hall that's the plan for that's the plan for what space the city requires and justifies the need for a city hall um, new police station um, potentially a, a corporation yard the facilities master plan is the the, the, the city's planning for its physical space. So that's the deliverable of the project. So it's does the how that project is delivered, does it strengthen civic identity more having a Fuse Fellow without? Um, I hope the answer to that is that it strengthens the civic identity more having had a Fuse Fellow engage the city and the community. Um, so when I think about the process that we took delivering on that and the amount of engagement that we were doing that is outside of a, a standard process of facilities master planning. Right? If you go to another city and ask them what their process looks like, there's no 12 meetups. You know, there's no innovation lab. right? So much of what we're doing is making sure that the learning that we have from these experiences we create goes into the design process that the architects, the planners, the engineers, you know, as they're developing this product. Um, that learning also goes into the, 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 the planning conversations. So even newer projects in the future, right? 
can have that learning as well. We certainly hope so, mm -hmm. but it would be up to the people who receive your ideas That's right. to act on them and not just put them in a drawer someplace. That's right. Now you're, you're giving me ideas for maybe what a second year should be. <gasps> uh -huh. okay. yeah. So you are thinking of the second year. I, I hope so. I hope so. Um, I, I would love to see if some of the designs that we've been working on uh, with staff and community in terms of not the designs of the buildings, but the designs of the experiences they want to have with the city, the design of the types of engagement that they want to see. With as, the community. As, these, yeah, as the process continues. You know, I'd love to have a chance to implement those designs. Um, I'd love to have a chance to, like you said, empower the people who have a role in the next steps to take on those steps. Um, and I would love to know from the community what it takes for every individual to be empowered. Well, it seems in the process that you would be empowered yourself because you talked about that sense of accomplishment. Yeah. And I'm thinking that would really be a reason to have a, 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 full, a fulfilling sense of having accomplished something, right? Yeah. If you could have played a role in That's terms right. of... Right. And that, that experience that I'm trying to capture for myself, I want to make sure that everyone who works on this project Everyone who, you know, even sends an email, even if it's an email telling me everything I'm doing wrong, I want them to feel that sense of accomplishment too. Because it, it is all those voices that affect the decisions that everyone else is making. So I, I, if I can deliver, if I can share that sense of accomplishment, I think my goal will be done. Well, if you can share that sense of accomplishment, Certainly the city will have progressed in terms of its master plan and its downtown and that feeling of, of identity. Yeah. So it, it's a process and it seems to me it's, it's a process that's in process that we can all look to yeah. <laughs> yeah. to see what will be accomplished in September and maybe the months after September. That's right. If there's a second year, I'd love to, you know, share with you what that looks like. Well, thank you so much, Jerry, for being on the show and sharing this much of it. Oh, thank and you. it certainly gives us a lot to look forward to. Yeah, thank you for your interest and your hospitality. Of course, and I'd like to thank our viewers for watching. Until next time. Mm -hmm.